Um, hi everyone, my name is Lan. Um, I'm trained uh, in science studies and have a background in history of science, but, sci uh, but history was actually one of my worst subjects in high school, so I started out wanting to learn science, and science actually pushed me into history because I had so many questions that I couldn't answer. So in my background, in my interests in filmmaking and visual studies, with my interest in science and with my training in science studies, um, I'm bringing to the PSSN program kind of a, a mix of all three. So this is uh, this presentation is some overview of how I'm thinking through these different aspects of my research. So I'll do a little reading. Okay. So as the eminent anthropologist Mary Douglas observed, dirt was simply matter out of place. To be out of place was to be out of control, depending on your perspective. While this idea of dirt ex extended as a metaphor for social control over the body and hygiene, we can use the same metaphor of matter out of place to describe states of health and disease. Our bodies are always a little out of place, sometimes more out of place than others. And what's curious about these general states or patterns is that in spite of it, the body is often represented on paper in images as a stable artifact. In particular, its functions and physiologies are often re rendered as a line. So certainly, lines are symbolic, and signs can symbolize movement as we've seen with comics, but consider the properties of a line. It lacks texture and dimension, on its own at least, and as one psychologist put it, lines are ghostly. The lines also suggest clarity. They suggest certainty in a body where elements are constantly out of place. So take, for instance, Descartes' bodily mechanism where an unpleasant sensation travels up the body to the brain where it's processed and where the brain is also prepared to take more unpleasant stimuli. But in addition to the brain, other organs also respond to sensory input. So for instance, in Chinese medicine, there is the yang lung meridian where a path extends from the lung through the shoulder, down the arm, and to the index finger and the thumb. So along this path, needling and applying heat, known as acupuncture moxibustion, can <coughs> initiate therapeutic effects back to the lung. In cellular biology and neurophysiology, lines are everywhere, and they make different associations in different contexts. So this is Max von Frey's uh, 1904 lecture on physiology. This is von Frey of the von Frey test. So for physiologists who study the peripheral nervous system, and I'm interested in the peripheral nervous system and not so much the central nervous system, lines are problematic because at the periphery there is an overabundance of associations. Signal transduction is really messy, and while lines make visible some associations, they do so by obscuring others. And according to one physiologist at a touch conference last year, these lines are dirty. So in terms of images and representation, a lot of historians of science and art historians have written about images, and in particular, uh, so much of science is communicated through images. And this book on objectivity looks at how images and doodles and standardized graphs were used as forms of evidence. And in terms of lines, uh, art historian Robert Brain has looked at the predecessor of EEGs, lines that track breath and heartbeats on a graph, and lines that represent bodies that are at work, and in particular, these lines are coming from this uh, economy of energy that emerges in the late 19th century. But physiological structures, unlike a body in motion, have a slightly different ontological um, meaning in a way. So this is a different kind of thing. These are different kinds of lines, and for historians of medicine and medical anthropologists, bodies aren't universal, and neither are lines. So I'm interested in looking at how lines in different cultural contexts stabilize and translate physiological structures and functions. And I use the word meridians intentionally rather than the Chinese jing luo or other translations like vessels and tracks just to show how meridians visually captured reality on paper as a guide, as a map for navigating structures that are always felt but not seen in the same way. So understanding dirty lines requires a multitude of perspectives. And these perspectives that I take are mostly drawing from physiology, but uh, I like to look at the history of these different questions and 
in terms of the comparative component, compare uh, histories of medicine in East Asia and in Europe. So I'm bringing together my training in the humanities and the and science studies with new empirical research uh, as a PSSN scholar. Certainly these two images are not the same, but understanding how they diverge and converge in clinical and theoretical contexts, as well as in social, political, and cultural contexts, can offer a more well-rounded view of the body. So historically, physiology was more closely related to philosophy than anatomy. While anatomy, as we might assume, extends from ideas of evidence and visible structures of the body, physiology aimed to make sense of unseen actions. And it relied not so much on evidence, but on reason. And this distinction is a little bit blurry. What we would assume, though, is anatomists usually would ask, what, how, whether. A physiologists would ask, why? But even asking why, the full scope of physiology still remained unclear. So for instance, the 17th century Dutch medical teacher, Herman Bierhoff, who is usually cited as the father of physiology, but there are many father, fathers of physiology, depending on who you ask. So for him, he defined physiology as the sum or aggregate of all the actions performed in the living body. So this definition is a little vague, and still, Bierhoff wanted to look, he was using more uh, of his own experience rather than reason, and even though he wanted to talk about the aggregate sum of all the actions performed in the living body, he spent more time talking about the body than actually treating patients. But instead of the brain, Bierhoff placed the heart at the center of all things physiological, and the only point of having nerves was to keep the heart alive. This is to say that the body was a fluid thing, and Bierhoff borrowed heavily from Hippocratic writings and elaborated on humoral medicine. So for instance, Bierhoff and his uh, predecessors and colleagues, nerves were filled with nerve juice, which was just another form of blood. So this is where we again return to the specter of the line. If reason was the foundation of physiology, and if physiology extended from unseen phenomenon, how should physiologists represent functional properties in the body? How should they fix a line on a body that was in constant motion? Maybe we can ask, how should Matteo draw physiology in the body? Should it be a line? And what will that mean? To answer this question, I draw heavily from critical cartography, where cartographers, who are critical of cartography, basically agree that mapping was already an impossible task because you can't see everything at once, despite what Google Maps wants you to believe. So to summarize part of this argument, I made a short video at a fluid conference in December that's called Sunk from Sight, which I'll play for you. Things are hard to measure by looking. In the 18th century, when the French government was under siege, astronomers tried to measure the size of the world. They climbed up abandoned churches to gauge the distance to other towers that would partially reveal the length of a meridian arc, which they could use to calculate a course from the North Pole to the equator that, when further divided, would produce a perfect meter. But their calculations were wrong. The contours of the Earth interrupted their attempt to capture distances perfectly. The dipping valleys, fallen trees, angry villagers, all got in the way. Cartographers have long recognized the complex task that maps undertake, carrying an abundance of information while naturalizing familiar objects. Maps fix things in constant motion. They distort as much as they convey. Photography was meant to correct for this distortion, and instead of astronomical instruments, cameras mediated vision. When 30-year-old Cheng Da'an took out his camera, he intended to capture the shifting contours of the body to draw a map. Cheng positioned his camera in front of a naked man, taking in the back, side, and front of the body. With a developed photograph, he cut out the image and scratched in white and black dots that connected to white and black lines, locating them relative to the protruding ribs, collarbones, and deflated abdomen. <laughs> 
He then overlaid a thin layer of rice paper and retraced the body, the dots, the lines, and added names for each site. And as he re-outlined the body, the original landscape that he had labored to capture, the one made of skin, bone, and flesh, that landscape vanished. Its dimensionality was flattened, rendered transparent to serve as a standard reference for other bodies. Yet the ghost of its contours lingered in the redrawn outline in the anchored lines and dots. Rather than stabilizing the objective mechanical gaze, the camera only heightened the idiosyncrasies of the individual, so much so that Cheng would later abandon photography altogether and instead draw individual portraits of individual people. So mapping distances on the body, tracing meridian paths, required different technologies of measurement, which could still fail to measure things, depending on what you were looking for. Um, so the video basically shows that measured, I mean, globe meridians, mapping meridians that were measured in 18th century fat, um, France, not FRAP, um, but comparing that to mapping body meridians in early 20th century China. And what I'm really trying to argue is that lines crossed the boundary between anatomy and physiology, between reason and evidence. And like cartographers who are actually trying to develop stable categories that confined geographic topography, Physiologists, too, were drawing lines to standardize sensations that were always out of place and out of reach. So I don't take measurement for granted, and in my work as a PSSM scholar, I spent time in Ellen Lumpkin's touch lab mapping the peripheral innervation of bat wings. So my project still fixes the body in time, but the rest of the lab is really working on developing theories of mechanism as a way to contribute new ideas of peripheral signal transduction. Um, and then in trying to capture a perspective of living bodies, I'm also collaborating with an epidemiologist and oncologist to study how sensations shift. And in particular, we are conducting a qualitative study that focuses on stage one, stage two, and stage three breast cancer patients who develop numbness in their hands and feet after starting chemotherapy, which is also known as chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, CIPN. So this is really a very basic pilot study uh, where we're looking at Spanish-speaking, English-speaking, and bilingual patients. And we're trying to understand how neuropathy affects their quality of life and how it's embodied and articulated, because this is a, a really understudied field. And we're still in the early stages of re recruitment, but some preliminary data shows that people experience different qualities of sensation in their hands and their feet, which is interesting to me because hands and feet are usually where meridians shift from yin to yang, which I can explain later. But for participants, they describe a constant tingling in their hands and occasional sharp sensations in their feet. And one participant said that it felt like she had rocks in her shoes and she would take off her socks and her shoes or in her socks and then try to shake it out to see if there were rocks in it. Other people said that they felt like they had a hangover and still others described a rigidity that would climb or radiate throughout different parts of their body. But the plan with this study is to bring it back into my own research, historical research, and explore the contrast between numbness uh, as a range of sensations in Chinese medicine versus numbness as the absence of sensation in neurophysiology. So what these women are describing in some ways, which uh, include sharp, fast, climbing, bloating, rigid, tingling, Map on a little bit to Chinese medicine, descriptions of sensations in Chinese medicine, heavy, slippery, loading, sunken, and rough. And in other words, their numbness could be a kind of Chinese numbness, and that's in, in air quotes, in scare quotes. And a comparative historical uh, study might speak to clinicians and patients who are searching for the right words to translate new encounters with disease and toxicity. So these findings are really preliminary, but taken together, the historical and empirical perspectives sit at the heart of an attempt to capture movements that are constantly out of place. <laughs>